Uh, we're going to hit three areas up. Uh, one is an update on Willow Creek at Park Meadows. Um, that's in the city of Lone Tree. Second, we're going to go to uh, town of Parker, East Row Gulch. Have a sidebar about boulders. <clears throat> and then the third is some questions you may want to ask in the field, and that's all over the place. So we'll start with an update at Willow Creek. Um, this was presented last year at the symposium um, in video form. Dave Scudis, thank you very much for doing such a great presentation and video production. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick update on it, but um, as I was told, I should probably back up and just explain the project a little bit. It was, I had the video starting at the permitted part of the process. So we started out as a sediment removal on this area of, um, of the creek, and it eventually went into a much larger project when we found out some issues, and we finally got the water flowing under the bridge where it should be. So that's where the video is. I encourage you, to, it's still on the uh, YouTube website for if you want to go look at it. I thought Dave Scoots did a remarkable job on the video. It's very, um, it's very informative. But I had from the presentation two questions asked of me. And the first question is, did you guys do anything about all the vegetation? Because in the video, you see a lot of overgrown and dead vegetation. And given in the light of what we're seeing at the Marshall fires that Jim Watt explained, and just the general climate we're in of dryness, um, it was a question of, what do you do about all that? And um, we did actually do quite a bit of work. Um, this, I should also back up and say, Willow Creek is part of our routine program. So for us to come in there and do all kinds of levels of maintenance is very easy for us, uh, since it's already in our program. So if you look at this um, um, photo, or the map, you'll see that up in the left, uh, Maximus um, is an intersection and then it goes down to Park Meadows. That's the area we've concentrated on since the 2013 flood and Bow and Darren Bradshaw of our office has done a lot of work. When I was transferred to Douglas County, I picked up the program. And so three of our contractors um, that are on our yearly contract helped us in this effort. Uh, Arrowhead Landscaping, Valleys, which I always slaughter their name, and also Arbor Force. And I'd like to thank Tim, particularly in Arbor Force, for jumping in, and all those guys really, and folks all did a great job in helping us out. And what we did is we just concentrated on the dead material. We stayed out of any live material. We just accumulated the dead material in the creek. We spent over $30,000 on this effort with our three contractors. And as you can see from this picture, there were small piles that we took to our staging areas as this all handwork was being done. And then as we accumulated them, we moved them off site for efficiency. Um, one thing I would recommend is if you have these large piles that are built up, uh, don't leave them there for very long. Uh, it's a very attractive for somebody to start that on fire. And as I always tell our crews, you never want a fire named after you. So you have to be very cognitive of what you're doing. And then another thing that we always tell our crews is, is that when you're doing this type of work, there's a couple things we always demand. And the first thing is, is, is that we make sure that we're out of the nesting season, that there's no birds or raptors or anything in that area, and we make sure it's cleared. We use one of our consultants to do that. You can do that in-house, but you just want to make sure you're not disturbing any of the wildlife. Uh, the second thing, it goes back to that fire. We make sure we do everything in a safe manner. This is a lot of handwork, but we do have chainsaws, chippers, that kind of thing. And my definition of a buddy system is a fire extinguisher with every piece of equipment that has gasoline in it or can cause a spark. Again, you don't want a fire named after you. So we just want to be cognitive of that and really do this work carefully. But we can assist on this type of work. And if you see the dead tree across the creek, that's something we really want to get out of there. But we can come in under our program and help remove some of this dead vegetation. So that was the first question that was asked. I thought it was a great question, and, and that's kind of the update on that piece. The second question was about um, source material. Did you guys address source material? And I translate that as, what did you do with all the dirt that came into the culverts and clogged up the bridge? And if you see this picture, we have, we believe part of the soil came from this area, from this cut. And if you see in the second, or on the right, 
uh, that's where the soil ended up with, ended up at is in those culverts. Um, this is a different angle of it, and what I wanted to point out here is that if you see the band of willows at the edge of the creek, it's a little bit hard to see, I couldn't get a great picture of it, but it kind of, you can see the creeks maintaining where it always wanted to be. At some point behind that edge, it was cut out in a, in a flood maybe of 2013, we're not positive, but that's where some of that source material is coming from. So um, it's the end of the project, we have very few funds left. Um, we went back to the permit. If I stay high and dry out of the water, I'm okay. We notified the Corps they were good with what we were gonna do. So what we did is we basically just regraded the slope. And this is a much better picture. Um, and just cut that back, seeded it, blanketed it, and uh, did some weed control. But we're, that is grass, that's not weeds. And if you notice that we maintain that edge so we stayed out of the water. We didn't have any permitting issues. We didn't have any erosion control issues. So we were able to do that work. It was pretty efficient and pretty, pretty reasonable priced. And I think the project is, is turning out really successfully. So I want to give those two updates on that project. Uh, we're going to go to the town of Parker. This is Eastro Gulch. Uh, as you notice, there's two drop structures. And uh, Rick Dennett from the town of Parker brought this to our attention. Thank you, Rick. This is a high priority for us. We did not, I should start, we did not build either one of these structures. Uh, we're helping Parker with uh, maintenance of them, and there's some issues here. Um, a couple of things I want to point out is if you look at where the water would be at, it's pretty close lapping those, those first level uh, townhouses. So they're concerned about that. And I wanted to just point out those two trees in the middle of the drop structure. Um, if you notice that tree is right in front of the drop, and I believe um, the root system is helping the water go under the drop. The water is not going over the drop, it's going under the drop. Um, if you notice the boulders, although that's really not a good look for us, we, don't, we would do it differently, but the boulders are okay, and the grout's okay there. So we're probably gonna put on that front edge a sheep pile cut off, and then seal it back up to get the water to flow over it. We kind of want it to look like this. I know that's not exactly, but it's that idea of the water flowing over it and um, not under it, undermining the system. Uh, when we move up to the upper drop structure, we have the same seepage issues. Um, the water's going under the drop, but, but when you get closer to it, what we noticed is you see there's no boulder there. There's just the grout around it, and it's just disintegrated. And so, Urban drainage over decades has spent a lot of time developing our criteria manuals, the specifications on boulders and, and how to do things. And uh, Holly of our office has spent a career improving those manuals so that it, it, it gives you a lot of good information, but basically urban or mile high, we want granite boulders. And we have all that specific, I encourage you to go to those criteria manual. There's some really good updated material there. Um, but this is what we want to avoid. And this happened to us decades ago. We learned our lesson, and uh, that's where our specifications come from. This is just another example of just how deteriorated the rock has become. Um, on break, I do have a sample of this rock. If you'd be interested in looking at it, it'll be out at the registration table uh, for your inspection. Uh, again, I'm just amazed at how this rock is deteriorating, and it's something that's avoidable. So we would encourage you to go to our criteria and look at it. Uh, there's a lot of great information there. Um, a sidebar to boulders, as I was asked to go on a drive-by with somebody, I don't think I'll be asked again, but uh, we went to look at this and the contractor happened to be there and he's asking me, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you looking so weird? And I said, well, it looks like a chiclet and bubble gum. So he did that work, he didn't care for that. Um, that description of it, but he said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, I, I like a bigger boulder. And he says, I don't care what size boulder it is. That's the size on the plans. I don't really care. I pay per ton. So a two-foot boulder or a four-foot boulder doesn't matter to me, whatever you guys want. And it got me to thinking, wow, it's what would the contractor say? What would everybody say about using larger boulders? And said, a two-foot boulder is, meets our criteria. What about a larger boulder? 
But you go to a contractor and he might tell you that I have half the boulders to set when you go from a two to a four foot, I have less grout, I have a natural rock instead of all this man-made grout around it, and I spend less time on it. Now a larger rock's gonna displace more soil, so you might have a more of a haul off, but on these footprints they're not very large, so I'm not sure that's significant, but it's a question worth asking. So I happen to go back to, the pro to this site, not to look at this again, I've seen enough, uh, to see something else, and he had done this. He ripped it out and put two boulders in there, and you can see how much grout's gonna go, and it's gonna be a thin piece of grout. Uh, he did go through the design process, asked the question, they said, sure. Um, so on the contractor's his own initiative, he went ahead and did this. So that's why I'm bringing it here today, is that I think a question should be asked of designers, is bigger better in boulders? So if you have the option and ask your contractor, your developers, hey, if we switch this from a two-foot boulder to a four-foot boulder, what do you think? You might find the cost is the same, you get a better looking structure. So I'm just offering that question out there for designers and people involved in selection of boulders. Um, I'm gonna move to questions you may wanna ask in the field. And this is kind of random, but these are some of my pet peeves. Um, first off is, we buy a lot of precast concrete at mile high. We buy the um, undamaged, top quality concrete. That's what we're anticipating. When you go out to a site and you see that corner there, it's a little hard to pick it up, but that's honeycombing from the original casting of that piece. And so you can see there's a little form on there. Uh, the, the mesh doesn't show up very well, but this is a little more close up. Um, it's honeycombing where the aggregate gets all together. There's not enough paste in there. Something went wrong during the manufacturing. It might be aesthetic. It may not, it may function fine, but I think it's a good question to ask is, hey, I'm an owner's rep. I'm paying 100% for undamaged piece of concrete. What about this? We don't necessarily want to rip it out because it may be aesthetic and thrown away. You may want, as an owner's rep, is negotiate that and say, what's the discount on this piece? And we don't want another baseball cap. So we want an actual negotiated price. Another indication that there might be an issue here is what, I wasn't there to see this, but what, looking at this, it seems to me that this was placed once, damaged with a chain, they grouted it, then they moved it again, and damaged the grout patch. One thing we, we really don't want on these structures is chains. We want straps that don't do damage to the structures or the pieces that we're buying. If they are damaged, we don't necessarily want them rejected, but we wanted that to be negotiated price with who's, who's ever installing that. And so we want that question asked. The other thing I'd like to point out is if you see the metal bars on the sides of the pipe, uh, those are restraints. We typically like to see two sets of restraints on our pipe so they don't fall over. Um, and then our next question is, here we have the straight restraints in place, but if you notice, there's no concrete under the lip of that flared end section. We typically want a cutoff wall under there. My question is, how do you get the concrete under there now that you already have that in place? I think it's pretty impressive those two little pieces of metal are holding that big chunk of concrete in the air. But again, I think this is a question, was this sequenced correctly? And it's worth asking. Um, this I just have a lot of questions about. Uh, the water's supposed to go towards the pitcher, so I don't think they're looking at a hydraulic jump. If they are, they're misusing that term. But there's something going on here, and um, the one question I do have is if they concrete collar this, is it acceptable to do that knowing that concrete collars are not watertight? So it's not sealing that, it's only holding it in place and filling that hole in. So I think that's a good question to ask during the process as an owner's rep. I don't even know what to ask about this. It's, it seems to be working. Um, this I call um, country engineering, uh, but it's, it's working, so I, don't, I just don't know what to ask on that. Um, the last thing I'd like to bring up is flared end sections putting trash racks on the outlet of pipes. 
I understand the purpose of them on the inlet, that they make it easiest to maintain. As the flow comes up, the material goes up the rack and we can easily grab it and, and take it out of there. If you notice in this slide, it's behind that rack. And so you have to lift the rack up in order to scoop that out of there. But I don't think that really matters to us. What we're really concerned about is a safety issue. And Ben or Bonus, if anybody's worked with the gentleman in the past who's spent a lot of time trying to get me up to speed over the years, he once told me, you never want to put a trash rack on the outlet of a pipe because what if a kid in a high flow, a manhole pops or something happens and somebody enters the system? When if there's no trash rack, they're just going to pop out of it and hopefully be okay. With the trash rack at the end of that pipe, if they're in the system, they, they can't get out. So he always said it's a safety issue, and he really beat that into my head, and I just wanted to bring that out to this group and say it's something to consider when you're looking at designing these type of systems. Um, in conclusion, as Darth Vader would always say, nanu, nanu. Thank you.